Ah, welcome to the latest installment of the Fireside Chat. Um, with you as always, myself, Josh McCain, at jomac006 on Twitter and Instagram if you'd like to follow. And of course, at Clash of the Nerds on both Twitter and Instagram. And you can find us on Facebook, at Clash of the Nerds. Uh, with me as a Porg and BB-8. Um, so if you haven't guessed, uh, we're talking Star Wars today. Uh, Last Jedi came out last week. Uh, two raving reviews by critics. Uh, mixed reviews by fans. I know what you're thinking. What do you think, Josh? What do you think of The Last Jedi? Um, well, it's just there. I don't hate the movie. Like, I'm not one of those people who want to sign the change.org uh, petition to get it erased from canon. Um, but I don't love the movie. It's, it's better than the prequels. Um, but I think of the, um, of, I don't consider the prequels part of the uh, Star Wars canon, anyways, because I hate them so much. Um, but of the post-prequels movies, so episode four on up, I would say it's, it might be the weakest of the, um, of the five that we have of the Skywalker, the Luke Skywalker saga. Um... And I can see where a lot of people say it doesn't feel like a Star Wars movie. Because there are, there are parts that feel very Star Wars-ish. And then there are parts that it feels like a different movie. And I think that's my biggest gripe with this movie is it's very disjointed. Like it really doesn't feel like one, it doesn't feel like one director's vision. It kind of feels like Justice League. To where it's like with Justice League it's like oh that's kind of what Zack Snyder did. This is what Joss Whedon did. Even though this entire film was directed by Ryan Johnson. There are certain aspects of the film that seem like it was a different director altogether or there was something he was going for. I want to get to that in more detail. This actually might be the longest fireside chat. In fact, instead of just going from memory, I've got notes. Two pages of notes for this. Um, so I'll start off with some of the things that I enjoyed about the movie, which I'm sure I'll come up with, but these were just some of the bullet points I listed. I really enjoyed the opening battle scene. Even the opening humor with Poe. This was one of the few instances where I felt the humor worked. A lot of the times, the humor for me fell flat. Um, and I'll get to some of that in more detail. But the almost, uh, can you hear me now, kind of joke that Poe did. Um, it's kind of silly, but I also get what he was doing. He was uh, causing a diversion, buying time. Uh, so that was great. And his humor, like that was established in the first film. Well, episode seven. Where, um, you know, he's brought before Kylo and he goes, uh, so is this where you talk or do I talk? How does this work? Nothing like that. So that humor definitely falls in line with the character. So I know that bugs some people. It didn't really bug me. Uh, but that opening battle I thought was pretty awesome with the bombers, the tension. Like there was, there was real tension. There was like, shit, uh, is this bomber going to make it? Are they all going to die? What's going to happen? It's, it was a really good tense moment. I was like, all right, this film is starting off on a great foot because... Though I didn't read any reviews, I saw, you know, the Rotten Tomatoes score and the Metacritic score. 93 Rotten Tomatoes, 86 Metacritic, and then I saw the fan review, I think was in the 60s on Rotten Tomatoes. I didn't see the Metacritic fan review. I forgot to check that. But, so I was like, okay, we're getting off on the right foot here. And also I felt um, going in that some of the fan disappointment would be because they built this thing up in their mind that nothing can live up to. And so they were probably just disappointed because it didn't live up to that. Um, I think that's part of it, not all of it, and I'll get to that when I get to my dislikes. Um, uh, another part that I really thought was cool was Holdo's um, sacrifice. When she jumped to light speed and cut through that Star Destroyer, that was awesome. Just silence. I should have said at the very beginning, spoilers. I'm going to put spoiler warning in the description. Uh, but I figure if someone's talking about Star Wars now, what they think of it, you should know. Spoilers, so spoilers. Uh, but Holden's sacrifice when she shot the uh, the frigate through the uh, the I'm gonna call them the Empire, I know they're called the First Order, but I will slip up and call them the Empire and the Resistance. I will slip up and call them Rebels. It's going to happen, so I'm not going to apologize for it. But she shot it through the First Order, um, Star Destroyer, along with some of their other fleet, and that was just a fantastic scene. Something really cool that we have not seen in a Star Wars movie. Yes, I know it's happened in the Legends books or comics. Can't remember. I think Empire's End. It's been years since I've read all that stuff. 
Um, but yeah, so that was really, really cool. Um, however, I felt that scene would have been better if it was like Admiral Akbar doing that because they kind of kill Admiral Akbar off screen and I'll get to that late, uh, in more detail later. Um, so I just kind of felt they did Akbar dirty by killing him off off screen. That would have been a cool way to exit Akbar, him doing that instead of a character we just meet for the first time a quarter of the way through the movie, maybe even halfway through the movie. I'd have to like time that out when Holdo gets introduced, but she's definitely not there at the very beginning. We don't meet her until later on in the film. So I felt that sacrifice would have been better for a character from the first trilogy. Even Leia, for instance, if, I don't know, CGI, but worked to Leia doing it, um, just because, you know, Carrie Fisher died. So that would have been a nice exit for Carrie Fisher's Leia to go out on. But again, everything I heard for episode nine, there was a big thing planned for Leia, which I guess can't happen now because they didn't film any of episode nine. So we'll have to see how they handled that. Yoda showing up. That was awesome. It was just great. Yoda puppet talking to Luke, Force Ghost. Um, Yoda calling upon lightning to destroy the original Jedi tree temple, wherever they kept the books. Um, but I felt that was also a missed opportunity because it would have been really nice to see Ewan McGregor and Old Man Makeup playing Ben. Um, I know people would hate it if they brought Hayden Christian back to play Anakin as a Force Ghost there, but it still would have made sense considering at the end of Jedi, Luke sees Obi-Wan, Yoda, and Anakin, so all three of them coming to talk to him. It would have been kind of a nice touch. I know people hate Hayden Christian, but deal with it. He's Anakin. Um, but also seeing um, just... Even if you cut out Anakin, but Ben and Yoda being there would have been really, really cool. And then uh, another part I really, really liked was um, Luke's battle against the First Order. That was awesome at the end where he force projects out uh, to Crate, and he has to show it out to Kylo Ren, and they all blast him with the ship, and he's just like, mm. And that was really, really cool. Um, now, those were just some of the likes I could pull off the top of my head, and even though my list of dislikes is way longer i do want to stress i like the movie again of the episode four through set uh four through eight i think it's the weakest of those um five movies but i still like it like i i would say if i have to give it a rating seven seven point five um and it has nothing to do with it being a, a different take on star wars like a lot of people are mad about that that didn't feel like star wars that didn't make me mad Nothing made me mad. I wasn't mad. I kind of felt mad when I left the theater. But um, I'll get into detail of some missed opportunities, some scenes that could have been cut, could have been scrunched down. Um, the first thing that irritated me earlier on in the film was when we cut back to Ray handing the saber to Luke and he takes it and he tosses it. Now, him not wanting the lightsaber doesn't bug me. Him tossing it bugs me. Because, again, that's one of those things where they go in for humor and it missed for me, and I think it missed for a lot of people. Uh, just because we, you know, that's how we ended the last movie, Ray holding out the saber. And I actually rewatched Force Awakens today, and that scene loses so much gravity um, when uh, you know how The Last Jedi starts with him tossing the saber. If he were just t telling her to go away and not win the saber, or he like pushes it away and then she forces it on him, then he takes it and tosses it. That would have been nice, because that was a very tense scene, and them to just try to brush it off with almost Marvel-esque humor didn't work for me, because, yes, there is humor in the Star Wars universe, but not that kind of humor, not that silly... Eh, there is some silly humor in the prequels, but in the original trilogy, the ones with Luke, there's really not that really silly humor, and I felt that really hurt the previous movie scene, and really hurt the tension of that scene. Like I said... If, Maybe he would have like said no, and she like no, no, take it, take it. Then he takes it and he tosses it like that, not over the shoulder, but tosses it, almost, almost harkening back to Return of the Jedi. He tosses it aside like he did his saber in Jedi when the Emperor told him to kill his father. That would have been perfect. I would have been like yes, and he's like that would have that would have felt like a Luke moment, like he's become old and a curmudgeon, and that's how he feels about the Force, the Jedi, anything like that. Just tosses it aside. Um. Now, this isn't a character flaw that I didn't like, but I didn't like that the movie kind of repeated Luke not wanting to train Rey, like Yoda refusing to train Luke in Empire, because again, that's one of my complaints about The Force Awakens was it felt too much like A New Hope, where this movie, not a lot of it felt like Empire, but that right there, I was like, 
we're doing this again, or we're going to waste time on, I think the plan's called a coup, and Luke's going to refuse the trainer, refuse the trainer, and then finally he's going to do some training, and she's going to jet off like Empire. So I felt our time was wasted there. Because again, this is a two and a half hour movie. They could have trimmed it up and it would have been a better film. Um, now here's something they could have cut completely out of the movie and it would have been a lot better for it. Was the subplot with Finn and Rose going to the casino planet to find a splicer, slicer um, to get aboard the uh, First Order Star Destroyer, hack in and take out their tractor beam because um, again, I'm not going to be really covering it beat by beat, but the First Order can now track through hyperspace. So, that whole subplot, it could have been condensed down to Finn was a stormtrooper, he knows how to get onto the Star Destroyer. Rose is, uh, she works down in like, well, she works down near the escape pods in the bay, so I'm assuming she's a technical person. But we can also make her a hacker. They sneak aboard the Star Destroyer, and they hack into it, because ultimately... They end up with Benicio Del Toro's DJ who sells them out. And uh, their whole subplot is for nothing because he sells them out. He tells the First Order about the Reli uh, Resi uh, Reliance, uh, the Resistance plan to go to Crate and the Big Frick that's a decoy, which to me that might be a plot hole. I'm going to go see the movie again tomorrow. But I don't think Finn and Rose knew about that plan. I know because Poe doesn't find out about that plan until after they've left. And I don't think he tells them about the plan at all, so I don't know how Benicio, Benicio Del Toro's DJ would know about that. Um, so that part kind of bugged me. Again, I'm going to go watch it tomorrow, so maybe they do know about it, but I don't think they do. I think that's a plot hole there to where DJ shouldn't have known about that. Um, but I did like Benicio, Benicio Del Toro's portrayal, except for his stutter. I didn't like that. I could have done without it. Um, other than that, I did like how his character was kind of a swindler and doesn't redeem himself. He's just a dickhead and he sells them out for the highest bidder. I like that. I like how we, uh, kind of, it, it made it look like the Lando trope, but it wasn't Lando. And he sold him out and went, I got my money piece. But, yeah, that whole subplot, though, could have been cut. Like, it could have been cut down because the whole casino planet thing, I like, we have... I don't know. It just, it felt very prequel -ish. Like, it felt like something ripped right out of Attack of the Clones. That's what that felt like. Um, and they do call back to it at the end of the movie, where we see one of the stable boys using the Force, because it's a spark that lights uh, more resistance. Um, they could have done that a different way. That was, I'm not sure how long their subplot is, but I think we could have gotten the movie down to two hours by just condensing their thing down to where they just take an escape pod, hop on there and uh, hack in there. Um, also, I don't think I have this on my notes, but Phasma's wasted again. She, uh, again, they talk her up again, and then boom, goes out like a bitch. And I'm assuming she's dead this time, but it would be kind of funny if she's like now the Kenny of the Star Wars universe. She comes back every movie just to die. Um, that wouldn't be funny. That would actually annoy me. If I see if I see Captain Phasma in the next movie, I'm going to be like, Jesus. What do you think, BB-8? Yeah, we don't need her in the next movie. Um, Laura Dern's Vice Admiral Holdo, like I said, her sacrifice was badass. Um, but her character's wasted because I felt like instead of, I felt like what they were building to, and I think this would have been better, instead of the Empire being able to track them through hyperspace, she's a mole, she's a spy. Because she was very standoffish and confrontational with Poe when she didn't need to be. And so I was getting the impression that she was a bad guy. Which, at the end of it all, I'm glad she wasn't because, like I said, that's what I got the moment we met her. So I thought she was a bad guy, so that did subvert my expectations. Not necessarily in a bad way, because there are some subverting expectations in a bad way that I'll get to. But I feel she was keeping the Resistance plan of the escape pods to the uh, to Crate, a secret from Poe, just to keep it a secret from the audience. Which kind of irritated me because that's just bad storytelling right there. It's like, they were trying to keep the surprise from the audience, so she was keeping from a character when militarily it doesn't make sense to keep it from a character because they should have been prepping for that long before they get to create. Like, they should have all the ships ready to go. That way they can sneak off easier instead of it's like a rush because when they get to the point where they're evacuating, they're rushing. 
And so I felt like letting everybody know what was going on would have been the smart thing there, considering there was never an inclination of a spy, which is, we have to keep this a secret because there's a spy on board. No, they could have told everybody. So I felt that was just kind of bad storytelling on Ryan Johnson's part because they were trying to keep something from us, the audience, while it was keeping it away from a character that they had no need to keep it away from. Um, also, again, just going down my list, we find out Ray's parents were bums. Now, that could be Kylo lying or it could be true. I hope Kylo is lying and it was just a trick to try to get her to join him. Only because if it turns out her parents were nothing... I think that really hurts the story. I know a lot of people are like, oh, yes, that makes it better because she comes from nothing, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know. I think that makes her more of a Mary Sue, going back to, like, Max Landis' biggest complaint about The Force Awakens was that she was a Mary Sue because she could do everything. And I feel somebody from nothing that can do everything that Rey can do makes her character even worse because it makes it an even bigger Mary Sue. If she was, like, a Skywalker or a Kenobi... Or comes from like a lineage, or a Skywalker Kenobi, uh, com but coming from a lineage of great Jedi, that would make sense how she could naturally do these things because they explain that with kind of like Luke's natural ability to pilot a plane, that he gets it from his father. It's inherent in the Force in him. So, I hope they. I hope now that JJ is taking the movie back for Episode Nine, JJ kind of like, oh no, that was Kylo just messing with her. And these are her parents. Doesn't necessarily have to be Luke, but I think her parents have to be somebody. Just the way she was left, because I think if they were just junkers on Jakku, they wouldn't have left in a spaceship, going away like they did in her vision. They just sold her and drove away or rode away on something instead of flying away. So I think Kylo is definitely lying to her there. At least I hope he is, because if her parents do end up being just bums buried in a pauper's grave. Which, it's weird that in the Star Wars universe they have the word popper, but that's me nitpicking. So, that not being consistent with Force Awakens, but I shouldn't put that as a dislike. That's a dislike if it happens in Episode 9. Being an 8, that's maybe a cool character move by Kylo to try to distract her, or it could be Ryan Johnson being a dick, because I felt like part of this movie was a, a finger to all the fans and their fan theories. I do think he was kind of dickish about that because a lot of things we expected and we were making theories about from episode seven were like completely opposite. So part of me felt like they purposely went out against fan theories just to be dicks to the fans. Um, Snoke, just Snoke in general. Um, I did think it was cool when Kylo cut him in half. That was a very cool moment. I kind of saw it happening. Though in the back of my mind, I was like, oh, Snoke's going to see this and he's going to stop it. But they just kill Snoke. Um, and I know that, again, that was them trying to subvert our expectations because Snoke was set up in the last movie as, like, an Emperor Palpatine kind of person, Dark Darth Sidious. And then, boom, he gets killed, and he's no longer there. But that also, I mean, we watched him, like, force bitch out Husk, which I'll get to my complaints about Husk, too, um, from not even being on the same ship. And just and him, Snoke, being able to connect Kylo and Rey throughout the galaxy when Rey was with Luke and Snoke or and Kylo was with him. I feel he's a lot stronger than that and it should have taken like a combined effort by Rey and Kylo, much like Luke and Darth in Return of the Jedi to take out uh, Snoke, not just uh, Kylo just turning a lightsaber on. So I felt his character was wasted and we didn't get any backstory of how he rose to power or anything like that. Which would have been nice because it just, like, we got kind of a backstory for the Emperor, for the Dark Times. Uh, Darth Vader was seduced by the Dark Side. He killed all the Jedi that allowed the em Emperor to rise to power. So, I mean, even though we didn't get a detailed backstory in the original trilogy for the em Emperor, we we kind of got it. We knew what happened. Like, we're like, okay, Darth Vader killed everybody, and that helped the Emperor to rise to power. But we have no idea where Snow came from, and... Granted, not all mysteries have to be solved. Like, I do like ambiguousness about certain characters. Like, I always felt like they should, never should have given us Wolverine's origin in the comics. And the Joker should never have an origin because it makes those characters better. But in Snoke's case, we have a prequel to the uh, to <laughs> Force Awakens, which is the original trilogy. The Empire is defeated. And then we have the First Order being made out of the Remnants. So, it's just like one of those things like... We do need to know where Snoke comes from. So, um, I covered no Obi-Wan and Anakin showing up. And, uh, 
No duck. So, um... Uh, what else? The humor, a lot of the humor didn't land for me. Um, the only two funny things I can think of for the humor that landed for me was the um, Poe Dameron scene where he's like, Are you, I'm, I'm holding for Husk. Can I talk to Husk, please? And then um, when Chewie was trying to eat, oh, ear must pork. When Chewie was trying to eat the porg, uh, the porgy roast and all the porgs were just kind of looking at him with big yellow eyes. And then Chewie gives him a home on the Millennium Falcon. And that kind of made me laugh. That was that was some of the humor that landed. But like I said, Luke tossing the lightsaber. Uh, what else? There was some other moments. Oh, Luke drinking the milk straight from the teat of that manatee thing. That was gross and not funny. Um, there's just moments like a lot of the humor didn't land for me. I was just not a fan of the jokes they tried to pull. Um, let's see. Like I said earlier with the Rose and Finn thing, there was way too many subplots going on. I really felt it should have been a more focused story, and I think that was part of my problem with the overall structure of it. We had Luke and Rey. We had Kylo and Rey. Kylo and Snoke and Husk. We had Finn and Rose and DJ. We had Poe and Leia and um, Holden. I mean, there was just so many subplots going on. I felt it took away from the story, especially because the main plot of the movie is just one frigate outrunning another, and when you're in the vastness of space, it just looks like this slow motion going across the screen, not like some exciting dog chase. Um, so, yeah, just too many subplots in that movie. And coming back to Husk, after rewatching The Force Awakens then, I made sure I rewatched it today because I really wanted to focus on Husk. He seemed like a scary Tarkin-esque leader in The Force Awakens. He's reduced to a bumbling, sniveling, whiny bitch in this movie. And I felt that, again, another character getting not a lot of good service from its director and its writer uh, in this movie. And I felt Husk was just reduced to a sniveling, whiny character. Where he was a menace. He was very Tarkin-esque in The Force Awakens. And I guess I was them trying to go for humor. Again, humor not landing. So I felt of all the characters in this movie, Husk was done the dirtiest. Um, I felt some things about Luke were also kind of him being more curmudgeon. I get his wanting to be alone, but I feel Luke Skywalker wouldn't have needed that much convincing to go help uh, the resistance that Ray had to do to him. Uh, let's see. The aliens, I wasn't a fan of by the aliens, the little like horse creatures they rode, rode in the casino thing, those look cool. But for the most part, all, all the other new aliens, porgs aside, weren't that impressive. They just were kind of blah to me. Like I, I have vague memories of what they look like. Nothing jumped out at me. Like the previous trilogy, even the prequels, like all the alien creatures, like I could picture so many different ones in my mind. But in this new movie, I just, they weren't there. Um, the fake out of Leia's death where she gets sucked out into space along with Admiral Ackbar apparently. Um, that part hit me. I was like, oh, that was a good scene right there. Because I was like, oh shit, they killed Leia. Because in the scene, like you see it in the trailer, you see Kylo about to fire on the bridge and he doesn't. And then a TIE fighter fires. And that's what takes out the bridge and Leia gets sucked into space. And then um, they don't let it breathe long enough. I felt we should have done a few more other scenes like cut back to Luke for a while, cut back to Snoke, something. Um, to let that Leia scene breathe, because I thought they actually killed her, and then it's like, a couple seconds later, she Mary Poppins, what everyone's calling it, Mary Poppins are her way back into the ship. Um, I don't have a problem with her using the Force to get back to the ship, but like I said, they should have made it a little more tension, because I thought she was dead. I thought they killed Princess Leia, and they didn't, but they didn't let that sit long enough. Like, I don't mind the twist of her being alive, but I, I would have much rather prefer her, like, using the force to sustain herself and maybe them having to help her get back in, like maybe giving Poe like a jetpack with a mask and he shoots out in space, almost like Star-Lord uh, grabbing Gamora in the first Guardians of the Galaxy. Something like that, like going out to rescue her, but her just flying back, it looked cheesy. The way it was shot, it looked cheesy. There might have been a way to shoot her flying back to make it look better, but that scene did kind of look cheesy and I get why a lot of people did not like it. Um... And the last two things I'm going to cover, um, at the end of, I don't know if I'm alone on this, but at the end of Force Awakens with Starkiller base being blown up, 
I feel it's the Resit, even though the New Republic, I guess that was Coruscant that got blown up. I don't think they ever say that it was Coruscant, but I guess it was Coruscant that got blown up in The Force Awakens. Even with that being taken out by the First Order, nothing about the end of The Force Awakens made me think the, um, the Rebels, um, the Resistance, were on their heels, and the First Order was bearing down on them. I felt just the opposite. I felt... The um, First Order was back on their heels and the Resistance was building up, but the start of this movie, this is the complete opposite, that we're down to like 400 people in the Resistance and the, new, uh, and the First Order is about to destroy them. So that was a little confusing to me, and again, after re-watching The Force Awakens today, because that was another thing I wanted to rewatch about, I still don't get the feeling that the Resistance is back on their heels. The way they act at the end of the movie... I feel like they're they gain they won up the first order, but again so again um, discrepancies between the two movies stylistic choices between J J Abrams and Ryan Johnson um, so it's going to be interesting to see what J J does in the next movie and my last big complaint um, and this is coming from a wrestling background uh, for those of you who used to watch our wrestling channel you now I'm a big wrestling fan I felt there was a huge missed opportunity with a double switch. Like, it looked like they were setting up almost a pot, like with the trailers and the way the movie was shot, that Ray would turn to the dark side and Kylo would come back to the light and we'd get like a double switch. Like, Kylo would then be a good guy and then Ray would be a bad guy. And I thought that would have been a really cool, and again, that would have been a very good subverting our expectations kind of thing like that, to where that's something they haven't done in Star Wars where the bad guy becomes the good guy and the good guy becomes the bad guy kind of thing like that, that would have been a kind of a cool moment to see that, and then maybe the third film is Rey coming back to the light, um, Kylo helping her back to the light, um, and them defeating Snoke together. Uh, that didn't happen. Um, Kylo kills Snoke, and then they defeat whatever those guards were, and where are the Knights of Ren? Why have we not seen them since that flashback? That's a different take. But then at the end, um, Kylo's like, join me, and does the Vader thing, and Empire, again, we're rehashing Empire. Join me and we'll take everybody out. We'll bring balance to the force, kind of like what Vader said to Luke. And Ray's like, no, we got to join the resistance. We've defeated Snoke. And she's, and he's like, no. So it was just kind of like we had this moment that could have been really cool, but then it just went back to the way it was. So for as much as Ryan Johnson wanted to subvert our expectations, he did that, I think, in the wrong instances and then where a chance where he had a really good chance to break away from Star Wars canon and Star Wars tropes he didn't like he changed certain tropes just I think to change tropes and just maybe the troll fanboys I really think that was in the back of his mind when he wrote some of these scenes and then when there was a Star Wars trope that he really could have changed really could have been like a wow gut punch kind of moment they shot away from it and didn't do it so I th felt that was a missed opportunity and I know I said more dislikes than likes on this, but I really did like the movie. I'm going to go see it again tomorrow because I really want to soak it in. I might do a follow-up to this that might get posted on Friday to where, oh, second viewing, this is what I think after a second viewing because I have heard from other people that um, who didn't like it the first time they saw it that they liked it a little bit more when they saw it the second time. So that might be one of those movies you got to take in more than once because so much gets thrown at you because you have like all those subplots I mentioned. So there's so many of those subplots that, you know, maybe I missed something or it didn't quite fit together uh, because I was taking it in for the first time and going in a second time with a lot of the backstory in my mind now. The pieces might fit together better. And I'm like, okay, this scene that I had to complain about here, blah, 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 that actually makes more sense now that I've seen it a second time. Oh, one more like I forgot. I'll end this on a high note. My boy BB-8 right here piloting ad at and taking out a bunch of stormtroopers. That was great. And my phone's ringing. Forgot to put on the amount of so that's why I'm going to end the video. Fantastic. Remember to like and subscribe.